please welcome to the stage the Executive Director of the IBA, Mark Ellis. Jose Manuel Barroso graduated in law from the University of Lisbon, Portugal. He completed a diploma in European Studies at the European uh, University Institute at the University of Geneva, and then a master's degree in political science from the Department of Political Science, Faculty of Economics and Social Science, again at the University of Geneva. He earned honors in both. President Barroso's political career began in the early 1970s, and by the 1980s, he had joined the Social Democratic Party. In 1985, he was elected Secretary of State for the Ministry of Home Affairs, and two years later was promoted to the position of Secretary of State for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He was elected President to the party in 1999 and re-elected three times. Under his leadership, the Social Democratic Party won the general election in 2002, and he was appointed Prime Minister of Portugal in April of that year. He remained in office until 2004, when he was nominated by the European Council and elected by the European Parliament to the post of President of the European Commission. In June 2009, he was re-elected for a second term. And during his 10-year presidency, the EU faced some of those challenging issues of its existence. President Barroso is the recipient of over 17 state decorations, including the Grand Cross of the Order of Merit of the Republic of Poland, the Grand Cross of the Order of Merit of the Federal, the Federal Republic of Germany, and the Grand Cross of the Order of the Rising Sun of Japan. He has been awarded more than 30 honorary degrees. He is the author of numerous publications on political science, international relations, and of course, European studies. He is currently visiting professor of international economic policy at Princeton University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming President Barroso to the IBA. Thank you, Mark, for your words of introduction. Thank you, President of IBA, Mr. Rifkin, for this invitation. It's indeed a great pleasure for me as a, someone who has been trained as a lawyer, but who had not the time to be a lawyer, <laughs> to share with you some remarks. And indeed, because, probably because we are in Vienna, this beautiful city capital of Austria, in the center of Europe, I was invited to speak about Europe and putting, of course, Europe in perspective to the wider world. And when I speak about Europe today, the word that comes immediately is crisis. One of my students at Princeton University the other day told me that she has Googled Europe and the word appeared more than two million times connected with crisis. And I've been living through those crises the last 10 years. Not only the financial and sovereign debt crisis, but also the constitutional crisis, because some of you will remember there were two countries that voted negatively the constitutional treaty, and so we had not a basic law for the European Union. Afterwards, we solved it through the Lisbon Treaty. There were major geopolitical crises, namely the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, and we had, of course, at the center, the financial crisis that sometimes is described, I think wrongly, as the euro area crisis. And so I can share with you my experience, namely between 2004 and 2014. And I will start by that point. 2004, we had as members of the European Union 15 countries. 2014 and today we have 28 members. So it means that during those crises, 
we almost doubled the membership of the European Union. So this is not typically what happens when an organization is in crisis, that the membership almost doubles. The euro area crisis, and the euro area specifically, that was a constant light motive of so many discussions. Let's look at the facts. Today, and in 2014 also, we had more members of the euro area, we have today 19 members of the euro area, more than we had in all the European community before, the 15 we had in 2004. So during all those crises, the euro area, contradicting all the prophets of doom that were predicting not only Brexit, Greece leaving, but possibly the end of the euro, or at least a major reshaping of the euro area, uh, they were in fact wrong, I believe, because we were able to enlarge and deepen the euro area. So this is something I want to share with you because really I believe that the conventional wisdom today, the stereotypes, sometimes the cliche views of, about Europe are of the decadence, of decline, the reversible decline of Europe, and I really don't believe this is going to happen. And now I can't speak to you completely freely because I'm no longer in office, so the level of sincerity is increasing day by day. And what I can share with you is indeed what I think. I was saying that during the crisis, facing our colleagues in the G8 and G20, from the American president to the Chinese leadership, to the Japanese, to the Indians, to Brazil, they were asking us in a dramatic way, what's going to happen? They were pushing, by the way, I think with very good intentions, because the fundamental stability of Europe is critically important for the world's stability. But I was telling them, look, it will take time, because Europe can do things only incrementally. We are, we were at, at that time even less, we're 26, 27 countries, but 28 democracies take time to take decisions. Decisions are not so quick as markets decide. But at the end, by incremental procedures, we were able to show what I believe is the remarkable resilience of the European system. Now, I want to be very realistic with you. I know perfectly well, I can tell you, the difficulties and the shortcomings of the European construction, what still remains to be done. But I also know by experience that at the end, we are able to find solutions because what is at stake from an economic point of view, integration in Europe, but also political commitment is much more important than those difficulties. It takes time. Sometimes it's extremely frustrating, I can tell you. Energy, work, dramatism in some of those summits, the Euro Area summits, the European Council, but at the end, the solutions were there. And I hope that the same commitment is going to be kept now when we are facing new challenges one of them was specifically mentioned by the president of IBA, the refugee crisis. Once again, the word comes, Europe is in crisis because of the refugees. Let me put things in perspective. Europe is facing a problem, but the real crisis is in the Middle East, the real crisis north of Africa. That's where the crisis is, not only a crisis, a major tragedy. And people come to Europe precisely because they want to live in peace. And if possible, because they want to give to their children some prosperity. This is, from my point of view, the real challenge we are going to face, not only now, but for the next years. There will be no easy solutions. And it's extremely difficult. Why? On one side, we have to accept those refugees. It's a moral duty. It's a humanitarian duty. We have to do it. We cannot close our doors when those people are coming because they want to escape terrible situations of war. I was, during the time I was in office, I was, for instance, in Zatari camp in Jordania, in Jordan, uh, where I, I met many of those refugees coming from uh, Syria, including young children, namely the girls part of the camp, that were studying thanks to money from the European Union. I visited that camp with the Director General of uh, UNICEF. As I was also in the southern island, uh, of Lampedusa in Italy, that's very close to Libya, where we had all those people coming through the Mediterranean. And I can tell you it's something I will never forget when we are in front of more than 300 coffins with people that died trying to reach the south of Europe, including one of a, ma a woman and her baby. She was giving birth to the baby when she died just trying to reach the south of that 
uh, Italy island. We need to do something there. At the same time, let's be honest, in some of our countries, there is strong resistance to accepting these floods of refugees and sometimes illegal migrants. Not only they don't have a tradition of accommodating people from other ethnicities or other religions, but there are also in some of our countries xenophobic movements, including chauvinistic movements. And when we think about Europe's history, I think we have to be serious about those matters because those devils are there. They have not been completely destroyed. That's why we need a comprehensive perspective for that, immediately trying to incorporate and to integrate those refugees. I believe it's a moral duty, as I said, but also with measures of training, of integration to avoid new ghettos in our society. So we need to commit more resources, human resources and financial resources to this problem at European level, but also we need to work for the medium to long term, trying to help find a solution in those regions, because at the end, the real root of this crisis is the instability, it's uh, the lack of peace, it's war, it's also the lack of democracy and freedom in those parts of the world. And that's why I believe at European level we should do more. Once again, it's one of those cases where we have a conflict of competence, and I'm speaking to an assembly of lawyers. As you know, the refugee issue is mainly a national competence. No, no one can force a country to give to someone the status of refugee. It's a national prerogative. And so what European institutions have been doing is to try to have a kind of a common approach and burden sharing, because it's obvious that the countries of reception of all those waves of refugees from uh, Greece to Malta to Italy, on their own, they cannot incorporate all those refugees. So there is some kind of burden sharing. That's why, for instance, it was important to have the courageous position of Chancellor Merkel from Germany, even if it was difficult for her, and it is still difficult for her inside her own party and in the German society, but it was an act of leadership showing the need to have a, basically a moral response to which is to the problem that is indeed a dramatic one. And I believe, once again, that it will take some time, but that Europe will, need, will find a solution for this problem. But we need also, of course, the help of the global community. Not only the countries of the region, some of them are already making a huge effort from Jordan and Lebanon to Turkey, but also other Muslim countries, countries that the most population is Muslim, and they have the means to do more and also the global community. And from that point of view, we need also the United States of America because it's the major power in the world and we need to work together to find a solution for the crisis and war in those regions. So, ladies and gentlemen, what I believe is that Europe, in spite of its, all, all its shortcomings, is a force for the good. One of the moments I will never forget during my two mandates leading the Commission was when, on behalf of the European Union, together with my colleague from the European Council, I was receiving the Nobel Peace Prize in 2012 from, uh, in Norway, of the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. And precisely, that reminds us that the goal for European integration is peace, to avoid, in this continent, the same kind of wars that we had in the past, that were not only European wars, but indeed, world wars that had, were the most devastating in the history of mankind. And that's why I believe we should cherish what we have achieved during all these years. And at the same time, we should give a contribution to an order, a global order, based precisely on these principles that we believe are important, the human dignity, the human rights, the rule of law. And then I want to share with you, precisely because we are in the Congress of the IBA, some of my reflections based on my experience about the importance of the rule of law the importance of the, and the role of law. We need a stronger role for law. We need stronger mechanisms for increasing the rule of law in the world. One of the most famous contemporary historians, Niall Ferguson, a British now teaching as professor as, at, at Harvard, in a recent book makes a very provocative remarks about your profession. He says that if, an, if in the past lawyers were basically a progressive force, namely because lawyers have been, as by the way, in very eloquent speech, your president just said, 
almost always associated with expanding the Bill of Rights, expanding the space for freedom, expanding the guarantees of citizens and the dignity of persons. He said today, namely because of regulation, lawyers very often appear as someone who is benefiting from the system, an overcomplicated system of regulation, and not giving enough for, let's say, the reform of our societies. I would like to disagree. I believe that today the role of lawyers is indeed decisive and it will be more important in the future. Because in all those cases I briefly mentioned, one of the points we had to deal at political level and at policy level was precisely regulation and how to look in an innovative way to the new challenge of regulation. Look at the financial crisis. Financial crisis that in fact very often is a called the euro area crisis, but it did not start in Europe, by the way. And it was not specific to the euro area. On the contrary, countries outside of the euro area have suffered at least as much as the euro area countries because of the sovereign debt and the financial crisis. But one point we had to deal with was what is the appropriate level of regulation? That's why, at that time, together with the president, rotating president of the European Union at that time, President Sarkozy of France, I went to Camp David to speak with the then American President George W. Bush to ask him to organize the first G20. Because we wanted to make clear that it should be a global effort for some kind of level playing field in terms of regulation for the financial sector. It could not be just the Europeans or the Americans to do something if the others would not join, namely the, the emerging economies. At that time, we had the G8. Today, it's only the G7 because of what happened meanwhile with Russia. But at that time, there was not yet a G20 where the biggest economies in the world could try to make some steps, not only to avoid the return to, let's say, naked, ugly protectionism, but also to have some common principles for regulation and supervision. So this issue, what is the appropriate level of regulation in the financial sector is critically important. As it is, for instance, in migration. Migration is instantly the phenomenon in the world that is the less regulated. Many years ago, I spoke, speaking with uh, someone that I understand is going to be also your guest, Kofi Annan, then he was Secretary General of the United Nations. I asked him, why is it that we are having now regulation for everything in the world? I mean, there are many, let's say, regulations or charters for, from energy to human rights, but not specifically for for migration. And the reason is that some very strong members of the United Nations, including the Security Council, they do not like to have common world regulations on the issue of migration, precisely because they want to keep it as a, as a prerogative of the nation states, giving or not giving to someone the status of a refugee. But other issues that were also briefly mentioned today, climate change. Climate change needs some kind of binding regulation at the world level. If not, we don't have a, playing, a level playing field. And we have seen recently with a major corporation what happened when a major corporation was not respecting the regulations in terms of emissions of, of gases. So all these issues of regulation are going to become more and more important in the age of globalization precisely because it's quite obvious today that the national level is not enough. We need, in many cases, transnational or even supranational regulation. At least in Europe, we have done that, and we understand that. Well, of course, there are some debates about what is the proper level of regulation. I believe, like Montesquieu, a great French thinker, he said, les lois inutiles affaiblissent les lois nécessaires. It means useless laws weaken the necessary ones. Too much regulation sometimes kill the uh, um, subject kill the points that we want to precisely to favor. But some level of regulation is necessary to find that balance. For instance, the balance between something that is very important in debate here in Europe, the right of privacy and security. For instance, in the internet, an issue that is today a major issue for the legal profession and for policymakers and for political uh, leaders as well. So that's why I personally believe that you are going to become even more important in the future. A message that I'm sure it's good for you. 
we are going to become more important because we need legal imagination. When I was in office, not only in my national government, but in the European Commission, by the way, the European Commission has great lawyers, very often they came and told me when I was making some suggestion, a question that usually political leaders don't like to, a, 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 a word that usually political leaders don't like to hear is, no, <laughs> this is not possible. My friends, we are coming to a world where what was yesterday not possible has to become possible. Because it's completely different. The world that we are now living and the world we will live in the next future, after the financial crisis, the impact it is having, not only in Europe and the most developed economies, but in so-called emerging economies and in developing world, is huge. And we'll never come back to the statu quo ante. It will be another world. A world that needs precisely some of those principles that in Europe we have been developing. Not perfectly, but the idea that things do not stop at our border, that we need to have transnational or supranational cooperation, that certainly we may love our country and we love our countries and we are patriots, but also we have an obligation towards others, not necessarily to an abstract concept of humanity, but against, uh, towards others. That reminds me of a famous British author who said, my father loved mankind in general, but he hated every individual in particular. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to be cautious when someone speaks about mankind, because it's easy to love mankind in general and not respect that person, that man, that woman, that child that is seeking refugee, that he wants to live with us because he wants to escape war. And this is the point, to develop the society of the future, where we can be proud of our countries, but at the same time understand that what is at stake, some global public goods are important as well. And for that, I think the contribution, the intellectual contribution of the legal profession will be more and more necessary, and I hope also more and more successful. I thank you very much for your attention.